history of silk and the present work in six, seven minutes. And Theo gets to tell you about the awesome, cool future. So uh, <laughs> you know who's in charge. Um, but, but one thing that struck me listening first to Phil and Mim is, you know, Phil talked about 300 years of understanding how the brain might be working. And Mim told us about a brain that was 1,000 years old. I get to tell you about a protein biomaterial that's 5,000 years of making. So, you know, in six minutes, I've really got a big task. But our, our goal really is very simple in the, in the message, and that is you can take something that's been around a very, very long time, like silk, and, and you, I'm even wearing it for this special occasion, which those of you who know me is a very rare occurrence. <laughs> um, and you can, you can look at it in a new way over the years and start to discover things about it, and it becomes a whole new uh, sort of set of ideas and a new platform that has a lot of technology implications. So, in our very short time, we'll tell you a little bit about what we've learned and what we're doing, and then we'll have lots of time, hopefully, over dinner to talk further uh, individually. So, um, oh, I have the clicker. Thank you. So, uh, briefly, if you uh, if you don't know silk at all, this is sort of what the raw material looks like on the left, and you certainly know about the ties already that are sort of standard fare as a silk-based technology. So, silk is plentiful out there. It's it's used in all sorts of textile-related applications. Um, our goal has been to look at it in a new way, and that is essentially to reverse engineer what nature has provided. And one example is to turn it into something as mundane as a clear plastic film, and that's essentially what this is. And Theo will tell you a little, little bit later on how that becomes very useful in thinking about a new generation of green electronics and optical devices. And so it starts with this lowly worm. Again, this is something called Bombex mori. If you want the details, and you can see it's spun this mat under its, you can see a single fiber coming out of its modified salivary glands. And it's become a very efficient process over this 5,000 years to uh, sort of house these worms, let them produce cocoons that become the material that derives, the, from which is all the textile materials are. And so in the laboratory, we've decided that that's not enough. Obviously, the textile world's been around and very useful, but you can start to go in the reverse direction. And it's very simple. We can take the cocoon that you see on the right, learn about how biology has informed the engineering of this very unique fiber that makes up these cocoons. And if you're not aware of it, the cocoons and the fibers themselves that make, these, uh, make up these cocoons are essentially the strongest natural material in terms of a polymer that exists uh, from, from nature. And so as a you know, robust material, it's a very good starting point. And when you distill down the process after too many years of fundamental inquiry, it's all about just the protein, the silk itself, and water, and how the animal has evolved to control the content of water during the so-called manufacture of the silk to form the cocoon. We'll spare you the fundamental details today, but essentially what we do is reverse engineer the silk into a solution then of just water and protein. And that becomes the basis for now a new technology platform to make new kinds of materials. A quick example is shown on this slide. You can take this solution of protein and water, so it's a very green you know, technology, very simple, uh, ambient conditions, and we can turn into everything, into everything from the porous scaffold, which uh, you heard from Saul would be very useful down the road to fix his, uh, you know, his cartilage and his bone, to particles on the middle there, which are very useful as drug delivery vehicles for many kinds of therapeutics. Theo will talk more about films and coatings and how we're using those. We can generate adhesives and many other kinds of basic materials that we use for uh, some of the applications you'll, you'll see. Uh, for example, by modifying and optimizing the processing of this protein from water, you can actually make optical devices, reflector tapes, credit cards that have information content as high as a CD, a disc, uh, and, and many other sort of uh, reflectors on the left there that might look like a stop sign as you come to it when you're driving at night. And that's all just with the protein and water, which starts to inform a whole new generation of, of different materials of the high technology sort uh, that we can use with this very simple material. 
You can even draw this protein into a fiber and it becomes an optical fiber. And again, all the optical fibers today tend to be synthetic polymers in glass, which are terrific. But if you want to think about a, another generation of technologies that will conduct light and do it in a way that will also disappear over time in a programmed lifetime, this becomes a very useful platform to explore these directions. We make uh, very fine band-aids, and these band-aids, as you see here, have what we call microneedle displays on the surface. And this is a micro-molding technique to do this. Again, nothing in here but silk, protein, and water. We put a dye in here so you can see it. And what you can use this for is if you see the very little teeny projections on the surface there, they will just pierce the outer layer of your skin. And since silk is a very biocompatible material, this is a nice way to non-invasively, in other words, without a needle, uh, deliver a drug through your skin by just essentially taping this onto your skin. The drug would be embedded in the needles, and you would slowly release this uh, into your, your outside skin layer as part of a release profile. And these are, these are systems we've already studied in detail and, and uh, pursued through animal uh, experiments as well. You can make uh, devices like you know, screws, bolts, and so on. And so we're making a new generation of medical uh, implant devices that can be used and have a program lifetime to disappear in vivo while they carry out the function of regeneration of tissues, releasing drugs, and not having to go in for a second surgery and sort of disrupt the repair that's happened. And finally, you can make all sorts of medical devices specifically. So we're hard at work, for example, at making very small diameter blood vessels. Uh, for those of you who are aware of things like coronary bypass surgeries, you must harvest from one part of the body and use that to repair the heart in another part of the body. So you have two sites of intrusion. The goal would be to develop systems like you see here. And these have been made, they've been through animal studies as well, and we're continuing to perfect these, where these can be designed to uh, support vascularization, the appropriate cells, the appropriate mechanical properties, and be designed to degrade away in a specific lifetime as your native vessels regenerate into their normal state. And this would go again for poor Saul and his bone and cartilage needs, so we're keeping him in our minds all the time. Uh, Theo will talk a little bit more about sensor technology, but you can imagine, you know, we've talked a lot about foods and, and nutrition and obesity. You can imagine the next generation of foods of all kinds where you could have little sensors on the food. And you see an example on a banana here. And that sensor would not only track the nutritional quality of the food, but you could also <laughs> consume it or throw it away, and it would be completely uh, non-intrusive in terms of the body or in terms of the environment, because it's only protein and fully degradable components. And again, Theo will we'll, we'll cover that a little bit more. And, and you can also make flexible electronic displays. So here are some examples of draped silk films, which have patterned gold electrodes on them. And these have been very useful already in animal studies, where we can place these on the brain of animals and record brain signals. And this is very important, number one, because of the ability to drape with this protein that we're talking about in film form, you can get very good conformal fits to the very irregular surface of your brain. And that means you get better recordings. And at the same time, since this again is a compatible material, we can leave it there. And that means over time it'll degrade away after it's done its job to record, maybe to deliver drugs, to deliver stimulation as in what Phil was talking about, and then disappear again under a program uh, a lifetime. And you can go all the way into making uh, all kinds of interesting tattoos that light up and do various things. We'll leave that for your uh, imagination. So let me just close my part with uh, one more minute. Why silk? What's unique? I think it starts with what I said before. It's remarkably robust as a material in terms of mechanical properties. It starts with that. Number two, it's green from start to finish. It's only water. It's only ambient conditions low pressure, and you can make all the kinds of materials I've talked about, and you'll hear about more in a minute. It's very, very compatible in the human body, and this makes it very attractive for all kinds of medical devices. And we've talked about some of those. It's completely degradable, so you could virtually make anything out of it if you want. It's uh, edible, as I mentioned before, so it's edible in the full sense of the word, where it would be completely safe to use in contact with foods, cooked or whatever you want to use it with, and I'm 
uh, you know, living proof that you can eat silk in many formats. We have a uh, contest every year for the students I won't get into, but I'm still here today. <laughs> Very adventurous. Uh, and, and one of the more remarkable sort of discoveries in the last uh, year or so is, is the fact that you can, for example, store or place otherwise uh, uh, very unstable compounds into the silk. And when you form a material, like a film that you see here, those materials that you added to the silk become incredibly stabilized. And this becomes very useful because now you can functionalize all the materials I've, have, I've been talking about with things like antibiotics. Uh, antibodies, drugs, enzymes, vaccines, and this opens up a new way to think about distributing these kinds of uh, necessary therapeutics around the world without having to worry about refrigeration and, and many other complications. Uh, and so I think that's where I'll end the unique material features we've covered, and it's a very universal platform as I've hopefully conveyed for many different uh, material related needs and biological needs, very sustainable as a um, tech technology as well because of the green nature, and that leads us to the future. So I'll turn it over to you. Thank you. Thank you, sir. It, it's only fitting that, that David did the history because it's his fault that I am involved in silk, and this came from coming to Tufts. I used to be a happy laser physicist before that. Now I'm a happier silk laser. So, um, so I'm left with the, with the future applications, and so and so these are kind of our case scenarios. We try to see if we can imagine some some kind of outlandish applications, and hopefully I'll I'll give you a sense of where our research is go is, is going and how this universal material platform um, starts sounding almost almost uh, almost too universal. So some of the some of the problems some of the problems um, one of the things that David alluded to in terms of a green material and green processing is what what if you this is one of our societal problems for sure we have a ton of plastic of plastic waste in fact many 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 tons um, and so what if you could do that uh, what if you could eliminate this plastic waste now now what what it was the card this is the silk card that David showed beforehand now this card in our lab has has scaled up and has become very large. Uh, very, very in very large dimensions. So you have these types of sheets, and now we can we can have large sheets that are almost uh, that are almost nine by thirteen uh, sheets, and we're going into roll production. We're kind of scale up limited in this, but there is uh, but there's certainly the possibility of going up, and there are arguments of cost which we can talk about later because that is going to take away from the future applications. But you can mold mold the silk in devices like this. And so just to give you a sense of price, this is a very light cup that is made of silk that costs anywhere between two and five dollars. So not to use at McDonald's anytime soon, but a first step. If you think of where plastic has progressed from the very beginning to now, and the processing again is all water-based and all done at room temperature in this case. So, so these are uh, these are nice things. Other waste, other waste streams that we're very interested in is what if you could get beyond the plastics and think about all the electronic and the e-waste that we generate. We always want the new phone, and then all the all our old old computers, old phones go and and pile up in certain regions of the world. Um, so we work. This is some of the things. These are some of the things that we work on. One of the properties of silk is that you can control its degradation time. This is important in medical devices because you control uh, the indwelling of, of silk within living tissue, but we could control it also as a plastic that has a very programmable time in which it degrades. And, if, and in this case, what you see there is you see a meltable electronic circuit. We can now control also silicon and magnesium uh, and control it at fine levels, so very, very thin levels of these semiconductors and metals so that the whole device melts away. And so we have basically some electronic devices that, uh, that, can, uh, that can live and function with a pre-programmed lifetime. And, and how sophisticated can they get? And th in principle, right now, we can do complementary MOS technology. So we can, we, can do, uh, we can do transistors. And if you think, for example, of a, we were thinking of an example, one of the examples that we, that we did was make a CCD chip. So this is a small CCD chip. So it's, you know maybe 16 pixels, so not quite a megapixel yet, or 22 megapixels like in cameras. But that, that image on the left is that CCD chip that is, that is melting away when exposed to water. That's a, that's a picture of the chip, and those are the images that are, that are taken from, from that CCD chip. So in the upper right corner you have 
some prints on a, on, on a piece of paper and the, and, the, and the larger images on the left are the images that are acquired by that meltable circuit that then you can melt away and in theory you could, you could actually consume. So these are the types of applications that we're looking at. Uh, other, other, things, other things that get into the medical space, and I'm keeping these, this very, very, very short because I see this clock is just stick, stick, sticking down and I have very few minutes and I'm very, very anxious when I see that. <laughs> so, uh, so, uh, so what would happen if now your medical gadgets uh, started, started talking to your, to your smartphones? And, and, and so, so those sensors that you saw beforehand on, on the slice of cheese uh, are actually passive antennas that detect, for example, changes in temperature, vapors, or, uh, or presence of bacteria. And we, just, uh, and we just, did, uh, just did, in the summer, some appliques that you can put on teeth that transmit wirelessly to, uh, to, a, to a phone, to an Android device. It's very hard to do these things in an iPhone because they're very proprietary about their their codes, <laughs> but, uh, but but so so we made antennas that sit uh, that sit on teeth and and transmit, uh, and you can do the, the reverse as well. So what if you could use your phone to power devices inside your body or to talk inside um, to talk uh, to talk to uh, to your tissue? And so uh, you saw the the tattoo before. And the story about the tattoo is that that tattoo was uh, was an artist's rendition. That little gadget that you saw there actually required 60 volts to work. And so it's not very healthy if you put that tattoo on your skin because you'll get, you'll, you'll get a very peculiar hairstyle. Um, the, uh, uh, that that you see there instead is a wirelessly powered light source under, under, an anim, under, the, skin, uh, under the skin of a rat in this case. And it's powered by, uh, by, by 100 millivolts. And so, and so it's, it's like, it's like when you go and you, it's an RFID wireless type device and you transfer power wirelessly and you light up the, uh, the, the, uh, the light source. So, so we, we did make the tattoos now and we can sell them to, to <laughs> club goers everywhere. Uh, but um, most importantly, these can be wireless devices that are used for light therapy uh, or for optogenetic applications, in fact, where you try to open and close channels of communication um, on the brain through, through the delivery of light, and they can be left in contact and then, and then disappear. And then, and then the, the, the last application for the future as the clock winds down is, is what, if you, what if you could actually deliver vaccines to places where vaccines are very hard to deliver? And this goes back to the remarkable property of civilization that silk has for labile compounds, so for drugs that need uh, that need uh, uh, to be refrigerated ordinarily, we have done some results where we started by by storing liquid penicillin uh, in silk and, and and showing that it was uh, its its potency was maintained for two months after storing uh, the penicillin in the film of silk, much like what you see there in the in the wallet for uh, for two months at 60 degrees C, so at 140 degrees Fahrenheit, and then we carried out the results for more relevant vaccines like MMR, so like measles, mumps, and, and rubella. And this is a very nice alternative to what you do have today to deliver <laughs> these vaccines, which are these portable refrigerators that are solar powered and that are put uh, on a camel's back. Uh, this captured, that captured the attention, uh, the attention of, uh, of the press, uh, certainly because of the MMR results, but also think about the needles as well. Now you also not only have uh, a storage medium in the silk, but you also have a delivery method as well, where you entrain the drug, and then and then the needles will dissolve under your skin and deliver uh, and deliver the medication. And uh, and this is a very a very nice story because it comes full circle. This is a picture that I took during during a visit this summer to Cambodia. This is a mulberry farm, uh, and this is a United Nations pilot plant project where they are repurposing these farms to um, to print uh, to uh, to plant. Uh, uh, to 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 recultivate with uh, with silk, and so uh, and so it's very interesting the circle that you have, where uh, where you can actually get microeconomies to play to play a role in our process, where uh, where we source our material at fair trade prices from these farms, and then we go back into into a green high tech product that eventually can be reincorporated in the environment. And in a certain way, more poetically, you could see that that kid that doesn't have access to medical care could actually get. Uh, as a byproduct, a sheet of silk with a vaccine or the medication that they would need uh, when access is scarce. 
and this this is uh, uh, this this has been an activity that has really uh, that has really kept us busy. I would say we have uh, we have a number of uh, number of partners uh, and certainly traditional funding sources, uh, operations with the United Nations, and a slew of uh, of collaborators throughout uh, throughout the United States and uh, and uh, and the world that certainly have made this possible. Thank you very much.